Uh, I would like to open uh, this uh, afternoon's program uh, in honor of uh, Professor Walking Sun. My name is Misha, so I will be the chair of uh, the two sections this afternoon. Uh, the first speaker of uh, this afternoon is Jenny Feely. Uh, her uh, title of the paper is Lean Announce uh, Catalysis for Diesel Application Commercial uh, Challenges. Thank you, Misha. I'd like to start by uh, thanking Professor Zockler and the others who invited me to give this presentation here today. It is quite an honor. Um, I will leave the true mechanistic discussions of Lean Knox to the professionals in that area, Professor Kong and Professor Zockler. Uh, what I'd like to try to do today is talk about Lean Knox and some commercial challenges that are remaining uh, to really make this technology viable uh, for diesel applications. So I'll give a brief overview of the current state-of-the-art catalysis from an Englehard perspective. Uh, this was all work that I did at Englehard in collaboration with my colleagues Michelle Biba and Bob Parado, and uh, try to give you a feel for where the current state-of-the-art is in this very exciting field. I'm sure you have all seen this plot many a time, so I will not spend too much time on it. I simply put it up today to reemphasize that for diesel applications, uh, we are far, far uh, from the stoichiometric point. We are up at an air to fuel ratio of about 22 to 28, uh, making NOx reduction uh, very unfavorable over traditional three-way catalysts. Uh, the goals, of course, for Lean Knox uh, abatement uh, would be, as uh, was described this morning, ideally Knox decomposition, uh, the holy grail, although thermodynamically favorable. I have to agree with this morning's speaker that there is no current available technology that works at high space velocities, and uh, the very demanding conditions in terms of water content and sulfur content in the feeds. A much more viable approach, which is currently getting a lot of interest in both academic and in, in industry, is the lean NOx reduction with hydrocarbons uh, for the diesel application. Unfortunately, uh, for diesels, there are very few hydrocarbons present in the exhaust. So this really requires a systems approach, uh, not only catalyst design, but a design for the injection or introduction of hydrocarbons before the lean NOx catalyst. And this is look, being looked at in two very general ways right now. One is by uh, controlling the combustion process with such an engine advancements such as common rail injectors, which allow more hydrocarbons to leak out of the diesel engine and into the exhaust. And the other is through fuel injection into the exhaust, uh, either straight diesel fuel or modified diesel fuel. Uh, in general, uh, the combustion modification is being pursued for light duty diesel engines and the direct injection is being pursued most heavily um, by heavy duty engines. Okay, back to the goals of the reaction. Uh, because we are going to be having to add hydrocarbon in the form of an onboard fuel, it is not currently thought that a fuel such as ammonia or uh, other reductant uh, that's not on board would be viable due to handling problems. Uh, we need to minimize the undesired reaction, which is the combustion of the hydrocarbon that we add, uh, because this will relate in a fuel penalty if we use all of the hydrocarbon to react with oxygen versus the selective reduction of NOx. So this is really a key parameter for the success of this technology. And engine companies are really hoping to get selectivities of greater than 50%. Current state of the art, I'd say we're at about 10 to 15 percent selectivity. So there are a lot of challenges out there in terms of catalyst selectivity. Uh, some other uh, selectivity issues are the incomplete reduction of NOx to nitrous oxide, which happens over a large class of low temperature NOx reduction materials and is undesirable because that is the formation of a greenhouse gas. Also, the oxidation of SO2 to SO3 uh, is undesirable and really unacceptable because this adds to the weight of the particulates coming out of the exhaust and those are a regulated emission. 
Uh, in terms of temperature requirements, that's going to vary quite a bit depending on the engine that you're uh, configuring the catalyst for. I show simply here an FTP uh, plot where I've normalized the amount of NOx emissions as a function of temperature at different engine operating conditions. And you can see over this particular test on a heavy duty engine, NOx is formed very heavily between 150 and 400 degrees C over the, the test cycle. So in general, temperature uh, for NOx reduction should be between 150 and 500, but again, this will depend on the temperature cycle during the test that's being applied. We've already touched on selectivity. Uh, space velocity, velocity demands are very high. Uh, for diesel cars, space velocities will be between 25 and 50,000. And for diesel trucks, they'll be up in this 200,000 inverse hour range. And this is really controlled by the pressure drop across the honeycomb. You cannot simply add more catalyst because you will get a fuel penalty and a loss in engine performance. Uh, durability is an issue, and I'll address this with some copper ZSM5 based materials and go into some results there. And eventually, uh, we will have to do four-way catalysis, reduction of NOx, but also oxidation of hydrocarbons, CO, and particulates from the engine exhaust. Put this up very quickly as background slide. Um, this just shows some of the materials that are active for ammonia SCR. And really, we can take some leads in hydrocarbon SCR from these generic classes mm -hmm. of materials. At low temperature, we see that platinum-based materials are very effective. And at high temperatures, we see that zeolites are very effective. Unfortunately, in the Lee Knox area right now, this middle temperature range is where the most work needs to be done. We do not have a very effective catalyst uh, for reduction of NOx uh, with hydrocarbons in the lean environment in this middle temperature range. Uh, these results were obtained with propylene in the lab, and you see reduction of NOx over the platinum base, very similar uh, as if you had used ammonia. And on a zeolite based material, the famous copper ZSM5 at high temperature. But again, in this intermediate temperature range, uh, we still need an invention. And in fact, this range widens with catalyst aging. Uh, platinum becomes less active, and the copper ZSM5 moves to much higher temperature. So this is still the critical gap. Okay, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some improved high temperature materials. And I have to apologize that I can't tell you what catalyst day is. Um, but I can say that it is based on copper ZSM5. Uh, we have published these results uh, in the SAE meeting, but we do not have the compositions fully patented yet, so I apologize for that. But the reason that I think it's useful to show is because really the improvements that have been made in copper ZSM5 and high temperature callus formulations are those in terms of durability. Very little progress has been made in terms of moving the active temperature window to lower temperatures for these materials to fill that gap. Uh, and very little has been done to improve the selectivity of these materials. Uh, Engelhardt and others, though, have made some improvements in terms of hydrothermal durability. And these are NOx reduction profiles with propylene in the feed after aging at 700 degrees in the presence of steam. And you can see that uh, we are much better than copper ZSM5, and believe me, I can make copper ZSM5 that is way down here under these conditions. So this is a very good copper ZSM5. Okay, we also tested this callus using direct diesel fuel injection, and this was on a light duty diesel engine, a 2.5 liter Ford Transit. And you can see that with increasing hydrocarbon to NOx ratios, you get increasing levels of on NOx conversion, and this is expected from our results with propylene. But the temperature window basically is the same with diesel fuel as it was with propylene. Okay. Now in terms of durability, uh, hydrothermal durability is one thing, but there are a lot of poisons or potential poisons present in the diesel exhaust which can also potentially deactivate the catalyst. And what I show here uh, are some tests that we did after diesel aging for 125 hours and for 500 hours. Uh, the test cycles were a little bit different, uh, and we did many, many of these tests. But basically, I 
present these two because this was a cyclic aging done at low and high temperature to mimic poison uh, lay down at low temperature and burn off at higher temperature. And then also an example where we simply aged below full speed uh, to really stress the callus hydrothermally. And what you see is that uh, we do lose some low temperature performance. And this goes back to what I said earlier about this need for a new catalyst in this middle temperature range. After aging, the copper, zeus, and five base materials do lose uh, in their low temperature range. I'll show you some characterization that we did to understand this aging. Uh, and basically, again, since we're dealing with honeycomb samples, you can imagine a poison gradient along the honeycomb from the inlet to the outlet. So we looked at both the inlet and the outlet of the honeycomb with a variety of characterization tools. Uh, the first thing that we looked at was the x-ray diffraction, and we saw no loss in zeolite crystallinity, no growth of new phases, and no loss of old phases. So that really wasn't very useful. However, we did get very good uh, data out of these three techniques. Uh, both the 125-hour age sample and also the 500-hour age sample were very dark with a lot of uh, carbonaceous species when we took them out of the exhaust. So we looked at this with SEM, and you can see the fresh zeolite crystals up here uh, look much cleaner, much sharper crystals. And then down here, uh, we see what we call popcorn carbon developing on the surface. This is removed upon calcination to about 550 or 600 degrees C. And you can see this uh, in terms of surface carbon concentration with XPS. And this was pretty much independent of the location of the core that we took from the honeycomb. Then after aging, the carbon concentration was much higher, but it was easily removed by recalcination. Unfortunately, the activity of the callus did not come back at that point. So the poisoning, or the deactivation mechanism rather, was not poor mouth blocking of the zeolite by carbonaceous species. We looked a little bit more detail uh, with microprobe work. Uh, and here you see the uh, cordyrite substrate, and you see the wash coat uh, on that substrate. And here it's just blown up in a little bit more detail. And what we did with microprobe is analyze the wash coat gas interface all the way down through the wash coat to the wash coat substrate interface and looked at the concentrations of uh, certain species in the wash coat. And here's just a representative uh, analysis that we got. We averaged many, many analyses for multiple positions within the honeycombs. Uh, but this, in general, is what we found, OK? You see a very high concentration of phosphorus and zinc at the inlet of the wash coat, where the gas and wash coat interface is placed. Uh, this is commonly seen uh, in environmental catalysis, where you have these sorts of species present in your lubricating package. They tend to deposit on uh, the front end of the wash coat and form glaze-type materials, which could potentially uh, interfere with the catalysis within the wash coat. Uh, sulfur seemed to penetrate throughout the wash coat uh, more of a chemical poisoning than a masking. And uh, the calcium also penetrated throughout. So the question was, which of these uh, potential poisons was really uh, deactivating this uh, ZSM5 based catalyst. Uh, if we look again at the activity results, the 125 hour age sample was the most active of the aged materials, uh, independent of where we took the sample. Uh, from the 500 hour aged inlet and outlet, basically the same activity with an experimental error. And by looking at the poison profiles, again, these are the average of many, many measurements. Uh, we can see that there's really no correlation with phosphorus, zinc, or calcium concentrations on deactivation. However, there is a clear correlation with sulfur concentration. Uh, the sample with the least sulfur retained the most lean NOx reduction activity after aging. Okay. We confirmed this with some accelerated aging tests in the lab where we steamed in the presence of sulfur in the feed. And in fact, uh, you can see here, steaming for 100 hours was much less detrimental than steaming for only 24 in the presence of SO2. Okay, now I'll switch gears and uh, talk about some low temperature materials. And I put this up simply as background to give you what the current state of the art in terms of low temperature 
uh, materials in the literature is, and that's really just based on platinum alumina. You can see it does a very nice job for reduction of NOx at low temperatures. However, it has two main weaknesses which are shown here. High production of N2O, most of the NOx is reduced to an N2O as opposed to nitrogen, and a very high activity for SO2 oxidation, which again for diesel applications is unacceptable because at least a particulate may. Uh, the new material, and again I apologize for the code, <laughs> we are in the process of getting patents uh, hopefully accepted on these materials, but for today we'll call it NSP, it's a material that has both acid sites and metal sites. And uh, what we've been able to find in this material is a much broader temperature window for lean NOx reduction, uh, which really starts to get us into this intermediate temperature range I talked about earlier. Uh, we still have a ways to go, but we're, we're starting to make some progress. And in addition, a surprisingly low selectivity to N2O, which was very, very nice to find. In terms of uh, SO2 oxidation, again, we found uh, in comparison with platinum alumina, which is the state-of-the-art low temperature catalyst, uh, we were able with this new material to shift SO2 oxidation about 100 degrees. Uh, which is good particularly for light duty applications. Uh, this type of SO2 oxidation activity is probably acceptable. Uh, heavy duty applications where the temperature cycle is higher during the test, uh, we may still have to suppress this a bit because of sulfate make issues. Uh, an interesting thing that we found that I'll discuss in a little bit of detail is in the hydrocarbon removal over this material. What we saw is basically two temperature ranges for hydrocarbon removal. One looks like a traditional hydrocarbon uh, burning or combustion, and the other looks like a, uh, a different type of removal. And we did a lot of work at low temperature to understand what was happening to the hydrocarbon in the feed, and we discovered that this was hydrocarbon laydown on the catalyst material. And in fact, this hydrocarbon is very selective for reduction of NOx at low temperatures. Uh, in this experiment, we carried it out isothermal at about 200 degrees C, and excuse this term coat, but we pre-exposed the catalyst in the lean environment uh, to the propylene reductant for 15 minutes. After that, we turned the hydrocarbon feed off, and we continued to get NOx reduction utilizing the stored hydrocarbon on the support for about 40 minutes, which was very encouraging. And in fact, most of that nitrogen went, or over 50% of the NOx went to nitrogen versus N2O. So in addition to be, being an active uh, source of hydrocarbon, it was also a fairly selective source. So that experiment, combined with a lot of other experiments that I do not have uh, time to show today, uh, gave us uh, two general mechanisms uh, for the behavior of this callus. You remember earlier I talked about the catalyst having two types of sites, acid sites and metal sites. Uh, we believe that the low temperature of catalysis is occurring on the acid sites and that gas phase hydrocarbons react on these sites to form carbonaceous species, uh, not necessarily coke. We haven't really characterized these yet. Uh, these are very selective to react with NOx at a temperatures below 250 degrees C to form the nitrogen very, very selectively. Uh, in fact, this species is so selective with NOx that if we remove NOx from the feed uh, and just try to react it with oxygen, we cannot get a reaction to occur. We see no CO2. Okay. At higher temperatures, of course, uh, these carbonaceous species will burn from the catalyst and gas phase hydrocarbons will also react with oxygen in a non-competitive way over a traditional metal site. And so above 250 degrees C, the catalysis that you're seeing on the metal is gas phase hydrocarbons reacting with NOx to form a mixture of N2O and nitrogen. Uh, in terms of durability, uh, we've carried aging out to about 200 hours now. I show a result after about 50 hours here, um, but really the performance was pretty good. Uh, we had a little bit more deactivation, maybe up around here after 200 hours, but it wasn't too bad. So we have fairly good catalyst durability. We did some engine testing, of course. 
Um, and these are some steady state tests attained on a uh, Ford Transit engine at relatively low space velocity, uh, but realistic for uh, light duty applications. And here I just compare platinum alumina with the NSP material. And uh, because of the light duties engines, uh, engine out hydrocarbon to NOx ratio being as high as it was, it was about 1.5, we did not actually have to add any hydrocarbons into the feed. Uh, this is a general trend that we're seeing in Europe, that a lot of the uh, diesel cars have significantly high enough engine out hydrocarbons to do a little bit of NOx conversion without the addition of additional hydrocarbons. Uh, so this is, you know, really something that may fall into a first generation lean NOx catalyst. And you can see we had pretty nice NOx conversions, much higher uh, than a platinum alumina based catalyst. Of course, we also have to have, uh, for a final product, some DOC functionality built into the catalyst. We have to be able to remove NOx particulate CLN hydrocarbons. So what I show here is basically one of our first attempts at a four-way catalyst uh, with some of the NSP type functionality built into it. And we just wanted to check that it was still good for NOx conversion, and indeed it was. We ran uh, the cycle A test, which is the European transient cycle, and uh, these were the results. Um, and again, because of the high levels of hydrocarbon in the engine exhaust, we did not add additional hydrocarbons. Uh, and you can see compared to platinum alumina, our four-way catalyst system had about 17% NOx reduction over this cycle. Uh, for first generation, probably for 1998, this is what engine companies are looking for. Um, kind of a first generation lean NOx catalyst without hydrocarbon addition. So this, this is pretty good, at least in terms of fresh activity. The heavy duty market is uh, much more demanding, but the time frame is much longer. Uh, they are not looking to commercialize until after the year 2000. And what they're asking us for now is 50% NOx conversion, which is off this scale, uh, between 150 and 450 degrees C with less than 5% fuel penalty. Uh, the data that I show here are data on some of the materials I described today uh, with about a 5% fuel penalty, uh, steady state engine results that I obtained at Cummins Engine Company on one of their heavy duty engines. And you can see that uh, even though the new material is an improvement over the copper ZSM-5 and the platinum alumina, we still have quite a ways to go, and we still have a large gap in this intermediate temperature range. And just two summary slides and I'll be done. So kind of want to summarize the performance then of the state-of-the-art high and low temperature materials, and then bring this new material into perspective, because it does make progress, but it doesn't solve everything yet. Uh, for copper ZSM-5, uh, for diesel at least, the temperature window of operation is, is thought to be too high right now. And unless people can make progress uh, in enhancing its low temperature uh, performance. Uh, platinum alumina is simply too narrow as is, and a lot of work is going into broadening out uh, the behavior of platinum catalysts. And some progress is being made in this area. Uh, both and even the new material need to improve their selectivity of hydrocarbon usage. Uh, we need to be using more than 10 or 15 percent of the hydrocarbon that we put in for the lean NOx reduction reaction. And this is where a lot of um, work on catalyst formulation needs to be directed, I think. Uh, and this is directly tied to conversion with diesel fuel. Uh, sulfate make uh, really is a problem for just a straight platinum alumina, not so much so for copper ZSM-5. Uh, hydrocarbon slip uh, is only a problem in CO maker problems for copper ZSM-5 based material. I didn't show that data today, but when we did our engine test for the copper ZSM-5 based materials, the hydrocarbon emissions uh, exceeded the white smoke limits, and that's really unacceptable. You can envision backing that up with a uh, abatement catalyst, but then you add complexity to the system. Uh, in terms of selectivity to nitrogen, uh, we still need work on platinum-based materials, and durability here is pretty good, but copper, even though I've shown you an improvement, we still have a ways to go. Last slide. Um, 
In comparison with these two materials, how does the NSP material really stack up? I've shown you a lot of improvements, um, but let's really put it in perspective. Uh, here we have a wider temperature window of operation, but we still have quite a ways to go and we need to boost the activity within that active range. Uh, hydrocarbon selectivity, particularly with diesel fuel, needs to be increased, um, but it is better than platinum aluminum. SO2 oxidation is probably okay for some applications, but sulfate make will be an issue um, most likely for heavy duty applications with higher um, temperature engine cycles. Hydrocarbon slip, uh, not too bad, but could use a little improvement. We don't make any CO. We have better selectivity than nitrogen, but probably not still good enough. Uh, we would really like to eliminate all N2O. And short-term durability is pretty good, but we need to go the next step and do longer-term durability tests. Thank you very much. and uh, some test results on three-way catalysts are saying that you make more into it with three-way catalyst than you do uh, with these types of abatement systems for diesel. Uh, a lot of it, particularly in Europe, is related to the greenhouse issue, and the reports are kind of scattered. Uh, I'm not aware of any direct uh, results at Engelhard that are definitive, so I don't want to answer that question the wrong way because the data is kind of all over the place. Um, but I guess the main message is that we would rather not make it, we'd rather do the complete job to nitrogen. Thanks. The second question was, you, you noticed, like many people have, severe deactivation of the copper ZSM5. What did you attribute that to? Uh, in the engine, it's mainly due to sulfur poisoning. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions. One with respect to the N2O. Uh, if you look at the amount of N2O that goes into the atmosphere from natural means, uh, agriculture, uh, things that we have no control over, it, uh, it dwarfs the number you were looking for, Steve, which is the amount that if all the uh, nitric oxides came out as N2O and the effect that would have. The second, though, is uh, with respect to the uh, the term you used, a four-way catalyst, to refer to the total particulate matter. Uh, most people uh, already associate the particulate matter, as we call it in a diesel, as though it were solids. It truly is not. Yes, you're The right. stuff that we refer to as uh, particulate matter in the diesel are really just very condensed, high molecular weight, low volatility organic liquids hydrocarbon liquids that are made by pyrolysis of the fuel in the engine in, in the mist droplets. Exactly. And that makes a big difference when you start trying to figure out how to get rid of it. But it's truly just more hydrocarbon, just different molecular weight. That's exactly right. I'm glad you pointed that out. That is the type of uh, particulate that we are able to evade. The type that we cannot touch is the dry carbon at this point. There, there um, is no dry carbon. Um, in diesel particulate. I, I beg your pardon. Now, we'll argue later. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've seen data with quite a bit of dry carbon, um, and these types of flow-through catalyst systems can't handle them. You're probably aware of a lot of work on diesel particulate traps that try to abate the dry carbon. I, I'm aware of many studies of the basic material coming out of the exhaust before it goes to the catalyst. If it goes to a catalyst and you expose it to the high temperatures and you don't burn it, then you may indeed bring it much closer to being a solid carbon. But stuff coming out is a liquid. We can discuss later. Thanks for the question. You pointed out that the platinum aluminum catalyst with its low selectivity to nitrogen and high sulfate made is fairly unsuitable. It's my understanding that in Europe, the 
the platinum catalyst is used as the next fix? Did you it, it probably is the next fix. Uh, for light duty applications in Europe for diesel cars, um, a platinum based material probably is going to go into the 98 model year. Uh, a lot of tricks are being played by different catalyst companies to suppress sulfate mate, and a lot of those have been very successful. What I show uh, as a comparison to our new material is just an unmodified platinum alumina, and that will not be the next answer. But you're right. Okay. All right, last one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suggest that your very lucid talk be available as a video of how many of us in universities we would like to know what the problems are. I think that would be a service to the community and perhaps to yourself. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, thanks for the presentation.